Well, it's so good to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us in our service tonight. Thank you for those of you that are coming in via uh, the online platforms. And for those of you that are seated, uh, seated, seated is another version of seated, um, outside in the garden. And then also to those of you in the theatre and of course, those that are here in the auditorium. It really is a great um, privilege for me to be able to share the word with you tonight. And I thank Apostle Theo and Dr. Bev for giving me the opportunity and for entrusting me with sharing the Word of God with you tonight. And I believe that you are going to be encouraged. The reason why I can say that boldly is because it's not my message. This is something that God wants to speak to you about tonight. And I know that because when I began to put this message together through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was speaking to me also. And it started touching on some very uh, important points in my own life. And it made me realize how easy it is for us to just move in a different direction if it is only in our habits or in our minds. And I believe that God is going to just help us to set some things right tonight. Our theme this month is coming home. And it is aptly named coming home because that is exactly what we should be doing. Perhaps you're sitting at home right now thinking, but but I am home. But we're talking about coming home, coming back together as a family of God, the way that it is supposed to be. And so, um, you know, I was just reflecting a little bit about how things were through this, uh, you know, this very strange and crazy 2020. And all of the stories that I've heard and and even myself at some point being a bit concerned and not knowing, you know, what is going to happen next? And and is my livelihood going to be threatened? And, and, you know, how's it going to work with schooling? And and all of those elements, it's just all of a sudden our world just changed. And I thought to myself, how good is it not to be able to depend on God? If not anything, when you go through something that is, you have no idea what it's going to be like on the other side, to know that there is a God that we can depend on and trust in. If only just to pin our hope against. Because if you have no hope, then you really are in a desperate place. So I want to just give God all the glory right now that we could really depend on Him and know that even when you are concerned, He always brings you back to the Word. He always reminds you that He's there. And remember this time, remember that time. Remember what happened then. You thought this was going to happen and that was going to happen and it ended up being a success. You ended up moving through whatever it was that you thought you were never going to see the other side of. I think we should pray. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together, wherever it may be, to hear your Word. Here as we are at at Christian Family Church, those that are here in person, Father, we understand and have experienced so beautifully what the gathering of the saints is all about. Thank you for your presence. It is so obvious here tonight. Thank you that our lives are about to be changed because of your word and only for that reason. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking clearly to every single heart tonight. And I thank you that change will be the effect of your word, not just now, but even in years to come, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you know, our values here at Christian Family Church is to know God, to find freedom, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference. Those four values, we've been preaching them for a long time now, and we've been uh, explaining why it is that these are the values that we live by here at Christian Family Church and explaining them to you. You can see that God always intended the spiritual journey for you, these steps that I've spoken about. You can check the Old Testament, the New Testament, from cover to cover, God wants you to be in a relationship with Him. And then once you are in a relationship, then you can begin to start dealing with issues in your life. That's what we term finding freedom. And then once, and this allows you to settle your yesterdays so that you can see your tomorrows. And then you can see the fact that you were created for a specific purpose. And that's why we take you to that third step to discover your purpose so that all of us can get back to our ultimate purpose and get to doing what the church needs to be doing right now. And you know what that is? To be making a difference in this world. All of these hinge, really. These four values all hinge on the first one, though. 
So you can't find freedom. It's very difficult to find freedom. You can't discover your purpose without talking to the one that created that purpose. And you really can't have the power to make a difference until you do the first one, which is to know God. A few years ago, I read the autobiography of Reinhard Bonker called Living a Life of Fire. You know, he had an extraordinary life, amazing the way God used him, this little German boy who grew up in a small town in Germany and And, you know, even his dad rejected the call on his life for many years. And and then we just know that God, when he has a plan for your life, you better know that he's going to make sure that it happens. And uh, in his book, he talks about the time in the 80s where he set out to build the biggest tent in the world. In fact, if you listen to the story, if you read this book, you'll see quite clearly that even the companies he approached in Europe to build this 30,000-seater tent Even they said to him, it's not possible. But in his heart, God had put this there, and God had said that this is what needed to be done, almost like a bit of a Noah story. And so what he did is he put together his own team. And they set about building this tent, and they did. They manufactured the largest tent in the world. It could seat 30,000 people. And, and, just, and he explains in great detail how big the setup is and how many trucks and trailers and, the, and the, uh, just the team to set, up, uh, set it up and how much time it took and all of that. And it's just quite amazing to read about that. And I don't know if any of you are aware, perhaps some of you can remember, the, the tent was pitched in Cape Town in the 80s. And Reinhard Bonker was not in South Africa at the time, and they'd spent their week putting everything together in the right place, but they were warned because of the weather, and they went ahead. And then a mighty storm rose, a great tempest, a huge wind, and what it did was it actually ripped the entire tent to pieces. 30,000-seater tent ripped to shreds. The only thing, as Rana puts it in his book, the only thing that remained was really the skeleton of the structure. And so he was phoned and, and obviously the very tragic news was given to him. And, and when I read this for the first time, I thought to myself, imagine Apostle Theo being informed that there was a, a I don't know, a grade eight or whatever they call the things when there's an earthquake on the Richter scale. Imagine he was phoned to say the whole of Christian Family Church complex is just flattened to the ground because of this mighty earthquake. I think that would be a problem. What about you? I think that in my world, that would be the end of my ministry. To me, that would be like all of this that we put together over all of these many years, I followed exactly the instructions and this disaster has struck. For me, it would appear that the, 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 my ministry has come to an end. And so he flew back to South Africa, and and so I'm reading this, and this was the very first time I read it. I remember reading as he was flying back, this man flying back to a country where disaster has struck to the scale that I think none of us can actually fathom. And while he's flying, the pilot comes on overhead, and he looks out the window, and he's looking over a, a huge city with all the lights that was at night, And the pilot mentioned the city that they were flying over. And while he's looking out the window, this is what God says to him. He says, God speaks to my heart and he says, this is where I want your next crusade to happen. You know, when I read that, it just jumped out at me that God was not obviously concerned about the disaster that had struck. He's not like, oh my goodness, Reinhardt, okay, listen, we've got to replan. Let's just get back to the drawing board. There's some things we need to change with my plan now that this disaster struck. The thing that hit me was that disaster doesn't change God's plan for our life. It might interrupt it for a while, but it does not change the plan that God has for your life. And so if you remember here at Christian Family Church and you've gotten on some sort of pathway and you were growing in an area or or serving in an area, the fact that this COVID thing struck does not change anything. That's why we're saying it's coming home time because God's saying, I want your crusade, your next crusade to happen there. Don't worry about the tent that's blown over and so on. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. You just continue on with the plan that I have. For you, And I just remember reading that and thinking, wow. And I've gone back to that portion, not physically into the book, but it just sort of struck such a strong chord in my life. And I've referred back to that many times, especially when it feels to me like I want to give up. And I'm reminded, and I know it's the Lord that reminds us of these things. 
So I'd like to read a verse this evening which I believe will inspire you. It comes out of the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 8. This is Paul speaking to the church and he says this, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it, as, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. You see, Paul discarded everything else. He intentionally set aside the things that don't matter. And he goes on, he says, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. What's interesting in this portion of scripture is that he says that he's throwing everything aside because of the value of knowing God. And that's really what our first step is all about, is knowing God. And you have to be in church in order for that to happen. You have to be in church for that relationship to flourish because your relationship with God also is dependent on the people around you as well. Now, what Paul is going to do is he's going to show us not only how important it is to know God, but he's also going to show us how to know God. He says this in verse 10. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul here is showing us how to know God by experiencing a resurrection, and secondly, to share in a death. Paul is saying, all I want, which is the title of my message, by the way, all I want. What he has done is he's reduced all that he wants and needs down to just one thing. What if we reduced our prayer list down to just one thing? We all have many things that we need and want, and, and recently we went through a 21 days of prayer and, and no doubt every one of us had something or a number of things that we were trusting God for. Things that you want, things that you desire, things that you need. And of course, it's important for us to do that. I'm not discounting the fact that we need to uh, put things down and trust God for them, uh, not because I think it's a good idea, but because God says you should <laughs> come to me with whatever it is that you need and pray. So this is his idea and he encourages that. But what we see Paul doing here is reducing all of his wants and his needs. I think of my little three-year-old daughter. If she had a list, I think the first thing on her list would be the spur play area needs to open up again. And it sounds to me like some of them have. So her prayers have been answered. Thank you, family, for standing together with us in prayer. But you know, also my wife and I on the 25th of July, we sat down and we compiled the list of wants and needs that we had. And it just so happened that there were 21 of them on the list. And by faith, we received every 21 of those answered on the 25th of July at 11 minutes past 10 in the morning. And then later on, we did a 21 days of prayer and I knew that it was from God. I mean, my list had 21 things on. Then we did a 21 days of prayer. So I knew that the stars had lined up and all of my prayers had been answered. But what if we can, uh, if we reduced it just down to one thing, one thing that can empower and bless all of our other prayers. This is the Matthew 6.33 principle that I'm speaking about, that Paul is alluding to, where God says, seek me first, my kingdom, just know me, and I'll add all these things to you. If you think about Matthew chapter six and the, the things that God is just referring to right now, you go and read what is listed there, the things that people uh, are concerned about and worried about and so on, and you'll find that they are everyday needs. In Matthew six, some of them are critical for us to survive, and yet God says, if you will put me first, if you will seek me and, and seek a relationship with me, I'll ensure that all of these things are taken care of. And I think that it is beautiful that Paul mentioned two ways that we can know God through Philippians as we read through it. The first one is to have a resurrection. 
And secondly, to have a suffering of sorts. We could define those two things like this. We could say that resurrection is making dead things alive and suffering is making alive things dead. In other words, if you really want to be in a relationship with God and know Him, you can ask and answer these two questions. Number one, what in my life needs to come back to life? I wonder if in these last five months, through the quarantine and the upside down life that we've experienced, if there isn't something that is really important to your faith walk that just doesn't exist anymore. What needs a resurrection in your life? For those of you at home, what needs a resurrection in your life? Could it be your prayer life? Could it be your passion? What about your faith? Perhaps it's your Bible reading. Maybe it's even aspirations, things that people have desired to do. I know of some folks that have, they set out to start a business at the beginning of this year or even expand their existing business. I was speaking to a pastor just a few weeks ago, his wife started a second branch and then this whole thing unveiled and that branch had to close down. I know of people where the business had to shut down entirely and perhaps your aspiration, your dream, your desire shut down together with that. Maybe COVID has gotten a lot more than just the start of your business. The Bible's word for this resurrection is revival. What needs to be revived? You know, something interesting about revival is that we won't see revival in our world if we don't have one in ourselves. Look at this verse, uh, Psalm 85, verse 6. Look what, what David says. He says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? You see, God is all for revival. He's all for bringing dead things back to life again. For some of us, that revival is for us to get back to some sort of weekly church service routine. For many, of the, for many of us, this online reality has got us out of our routine. I wanna encourage you to get yourself back into an I'm going to church routine or mindset. Right now, yes, we the church still operate with certain limitations. We have certain boundaries that we have to operate within but they're increasing all the time. I mean, just last week, we only had people here in the auditorium and outside. Now we have people in the auditorium, outside, and in the theater. Who knows what's gonna happen next week? They keep expanding. The opportunity for you to come back home keeps getting bigger. And so I wanna encourage you to come back home. It's the first element in knowing God. I think that it's a priority to let some things that have died in this time to start coming back to life again. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to act to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Yo, I have to pause there for a moment. Think about what's just been said in the Bible. God is saying to us that it's important for us to come back together again. He's saying, motivate each other. Encourage one another. This evening when Clive came up just after the praise and worship and he said that there was just so, there was such a different atmosphere when we corporately come together and the anointing was so thick and strong and evident in this place tonight. That's what happens when we come together. There are things that God can do in your life here that maybe would not be as easily accessed by your faith from home when you're in His presence. And I think it's quite amazing that God knew back then that gathering together could be threatened before His coming. And we know that all of the signs are pointing to that, aren't they? There's so many signs right now in the world pointing to that. And yet God is here reminding us, listen guys, we need to get back together, especially in light of the fact that my day is coming soon. There's so many benefits of coming together corporately. A few weeks ago, I was in Longabon. And I attended my first service in five months. And I just remember how it struck me how different it is. I'd forgotten in a way. In fact, I can tell you something. 
but I have to have a sip of water because what I'm about to tell you. I wasn't too excited about coming back to church myself. It was just too easy. I didn't have to worry about getting kids dressed. There were just so many things I didn't have to worry about. It was so easy just to go and put the television on. We could be dressed the way that we wanted to. There was no rush in the mornings. There was no raised voices. There was no changing outfits. There was none of that. It was just too easy, and I'd grown comfortable with that. But in my experience a few weeks ago in Longabon, in that service, it was a much smaller service, the lights came back on for me. And I pray that they will come back on for those of you who are able to come and perhaps are still, maybe you've gotten soft in your church approach. I don't know. What needs a resurrection? What have you allowed to die that needs to come back to life again? Could it be the worship experience together with brothers and sisters? Perhaps it's exercise. Maybe it's your zest for life or even your very own spiritual growth. Maybe you've become complacent. Well, you know, it looks like if we just keep riding this wave, we'll be okay. But just like Reinhardt, God had a plan. There was an interruption. It didn't change the fact that God had a plan. And in order for God to carry out his plan, Reinhardt had to get back to duty in what it was that he was called to do. Look at what David says in Psalm 122, verses 1. He says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You see, David was delighted when he was invited by others to go where his heart already was. And the word wasn't just the word go, but it was the word let us go. That's why he was so glad because his brothers were inviting him together to go to where his heart already was. Look at this scripture in Isaiah chapter two, verses three. It says this, many peoples will come and say, and that peoples, I want you to know that is actually spelt that way in the NIV. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. You see, God has every intention of getting you to his house so that you can walk in his ways and continue on in his paths. So the second thing that Paul brings to our attention as far as knowing God is concerned out of Philippians is what in my life needs to be put to death? Paul says that I know God by also participating in his sufferings. There are some things in my life, maybe it's lust, maybe it's pride, maybe it's greed, maybe it's attitude, maybe it's imbalanced emotions or excessive television, I don't know. But what is there in your life that needs to be put to death? Romans 8.13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We have to at some point say and recognize that an element is missing in our lives, but we have let something else creep in and we need to get rid of that. Perhaps it's stress. Or anxiety, maybe fear, or overindulgence. I've heard that that was a problem in some places. Maybe it's tension in the home. Notice I just looked dead ahead when I said that. Maybe it's tensions in the home. What about negativity? Let me tell you what this lockdown has done for me. I've never watched as much news since 9-11 that I have in these last five months. And you know, the news is not filled with positive things. How many of you can agree? There's no positive things in the news. But I have, it got me back to watching the news all the time. And when you keep your focus on negativity like that, it can change your attitude. You have nothing good to say anymore about what's going on in the world. You have nothing good to say about the government. You have nothing good to say about this candidate or that candidate. You just have nothing good to say. So we have to be careful of that. Or maybe... Just maybe the God that you had over your mouth that you so carefully watched to see what you say or how you speak to people. We heard Apostle Theo speaking about it this morning in his message, how important our words are. Maybe that God that you so carefully watched has been replaced by these pesky masks and you're no longer thinking about the things that you're saying. I don't know. 
What has gotten alive that needs to be put to death in your life? What is in your life that is competing with your relationship with God? This word has come from the Lord to you and I, and I want us to allow God to help us to become the best version of ourselves. And maybe, again, that might be in some cases. You know, we've had five months of this pandemic and other things in our lives that have happened in our jobs. We know of so many people that have lost their jobs or have been in super stressful situations because they have been told that they're cutting numbers and now you can't sleep properly at night and you're waiting to hear who are those numbers. Our families. There's been a lot of strain on our families. Perhaps you've had family members that you haven't been able to visit. Parents in frail care. You've not been able to see them and it puts pressure on the family. Our whole world has really been turned upside down. But I'd like us tonight to take a moment to think about that. I want us to allow God to show us what he wants to be revived and what he wants to be put to death tonight. So I'd like us to take a moment. Think about that. I believe that as I was talking tonight, the Lord was already showing you things in your heart. He was bringing things to your attention for those of you at home that are watching from home. Even for those of you that might watch this recording later on. Just by hearing that, it sparked God to trigger things in your life. And He's saying, listen, this needs to be put to death and this thing here needs to be brought back to life again. That's how much He cares for you. He's so interested in your life. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that God is interested in every detail of our lives. And I can't help but remember what happened with Rhino. just so striking to me. God's like, listen, man, we're on a, we've, we've got a job to do. I've got a path set out for you. The Bible says that He will direct us along the best pathway for our lives. Perhaps you may be on a pathway tonight and it's not the best pathway for your life. God's saying, I want to get you on the best pathway for your life tonight. So as you're doing a bit of introspection and allowing the Lord just to bring those things to your attention, I want to ask if there's anybody here tonight who believes that God wants to revive things in your life and put to death things that perhaps you've allowed to creep in. It's, no, it's nobody's fault. If you'd like to stand right now, I want to I lead you in a prayer. If there's anybody here tonight that knows that God is speaking to them right now, I'd like you to stand for you at home as well. You can stand as well. I'm not going to ask you to move around or anything. I just want you to stand. And we're going to pray together. And we're going to trust God to put to death the things that you're perhaps battling with or what He's revealed to you and, and bring back to life the things that need to be brought back to life. I have no one standing in the auditorium. Is there nobody here? Praise God. Praise God. This is God about to do a move in your life. He's about to do a change. There could be things that we've really not even recognized and He brings them to our attention tonight because of His great love. And so I wanna, I wanna lead everybody in a prayer here tonight. You have your mask on, so the good thing is that you can speak softly. No one's going to hear you. But I want you to say this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for me. Father, thank you for tonight, for showing me what needs to be put to death in my life. Father, I'm not able to do it by myself, but I put my faith in you. And so right now, dear Lord, I ask you to put to death. You can just mention to God the thing or things that He that is going to put to death right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you as we've come before your presence this evening. 
And as You've pointed things out in our lives, it's just because You love us. I thank You, Father, that every one of those things that have been brought before You tonight, that have been raised up before You, are put to death right now in the Name of Jesus so that we can join in our suffering with You, if I can put it that way, Lord, putting to death those things of the flesh. I thank You for doing that right now in the lives of every single person here on this property and everybody that is watching live from home or wherever it is that they may be. I thank You for doing that. And Father, at the same time, I thank You for bringing to life things in our lives that have sort of sort of died a slow death and have really moved to the sides, things that have been competing in our relationship with You. I pray right now, Father, that every one of those are revived in the Name of Jesus. I thank You, Father God, for doing that right now. I thank You, Father God, for bringing back a zest in the hearts of people. I thank You, Father God, for bringing back a purpose in their hearts. Thank You, Father God, for bringing back joy in their hearts. Thank You, Father God, for bringing back Uh, every element in their lives that is lacking, Father. I thank You for bringing Him back to life right now in the Name of Jesus. For those at home, I thank You that Your presence is just evident in the homes right now in Jesus' Name. Even if it is a body part, I demand in the Name of Jesus that it be revived right now in Jesus' Name. Father, we love You. Thank You so much for Your goodness. Thank You so much for Your grace. Thank You for Your presence. Thank You for Your love. And thank You, Father, for doing this great work for all of us tonight in the mighty Name of Jesus Christ. And if you believe God has done a work for you tonight, won't you give God a great praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you at home, outside in the garden and in the theatre, praise God. Thank You, Lord, for Your greatness. In Jesus' Name. You may be seated. Thank You so very much. And I'm going to ask while heads are bowed and eyes are closed right now, Maybe you're sitting here tonight, maybe you're at home or outside or in the theatre. And there's one thing that really needs to be brought to life and that is a relationship with God. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never had a relationship with Him. Or perhaps you were led to believe that you had a relationship with Him, but it was just a religious thing. If you're here tonight, I wanna invite you to meet Jesus. If you've drifted and you feel like your relationship with God is not what it used to be and you'd like to come back to God, you'd like to come back home as it were, I want to pray with you as well tonight. If you were to die and uh, um, if I asked you if you were to die right now, do you know where you would go? If you don't know the answer to that or if you can't say to me, yes, I know, I'll go to heaven, I know that. If you don't know that for sure, I'd love to pray with you tonight. I'm inviting you to give your life to the Lord right now. That's what I'm doing. So I'm going to ask if you've never given your heart to the Lord or you want to return back into a relationship with Him, while head is bowed and eyes are closed here in the auditorium and in the theater and outside, I'm going to ask you just to slip your hand up right now. I'd love to pray with you. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand, sir. Thank you. God bless you. If there's anybody else you need to make right with God, don't allow your eternity to hang in the balance and leave you not being sure of where you're gonna spend eternity, folks. If there's anybody else, you can just slip your hand up. Thank you for that hand. For those of you at home, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right now. Thank you so much for, for raising your hand. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I want you just to repeat this prayer after me. It's a very straightforward prayer, but I want you just to mean what you say. Listen to the words that you're saying, okay? Let's pray together. Say, And I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this prayer together with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. His life was sacrificed for me. Thank you that His blood was shed for all of my sins. And tonight, I give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died and was risen from the dead. I am a child of God. 
Praise God. Well, if you prayed that prayer tonight, even those of you that are at home and everybody in the auditorium, those that had their hands raised outside and in the theatre, I want to say welcome to the family of God. Come on, family. Let's just give them a warm round of applause. What a wonderful decision you've made tonight. It's good to have you join the family of God. I'm going to ask those of you that are here and in the theatre and outside, if you wouldn't mind just uh, going to the back of the venue. So here in the theatre, we have here in the auditorium, we have some people, some pastors that would love to meet with you. If you don't mind standing up and just going to the back, if you're in the theatre, you can just move to the back of that venue. Or if you're outside, you can stand up and just walk to behind you. We have some pastors that are, would love to just spend a few moments with you and, and just talk to you a little bit about what has just happened and help you understand what the next step is that you need to take. And for those of you at home, if you could text the word saved, even those that are here, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable standing up tonight, then I'm going to ask, just text the word SAVED to 4991 so that we are aware of you. We'd love to make contact with you. I'm going to ask everybody again, let's just once more give them a wonderful round of applause for this amazing decision they've made. Praise God. And I want to remind you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., we continue on with our prayer uh, sessions live online. You can join us on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, just go to our website. All of the information is there. Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, start your week on a high note and join us in prayer. And thank you so much for, for being here tonight. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, our very special guests, we want to remind you, please, would you uh, come to our Connection Center just out on my right, uh, outside in the mall. We'd love to just have a cup of coffee with you and connect with you. And uh, always remember, folks, to keep sanitized, keep healthy. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And book your seat for next week. Come on, I think it'd be good for us to, to end the service in a worship song. So come on, let's stand and let's worship God right now. Praise the Lord.